in the, in the places that we're, doing, that we're experimenting with recovery management pilots, and I can talk very specifically, and Dr. Char, you may want to talk tomorrow about some of the homeless projects that we're doing. Uh, the city of Philadelphia has had a significant homeless problem for some time. It obviously highly overlapping with issues of chronic mental illness and also issues of addiction. And those individuals have done very poorly in mainstream treatment systems in the city of Philadelphia. So they've created some specialized programs just for those individuals with the idea that we're not sure what the design should look like going in. They, they did something rather novel. Uh, rather than set all kinds of preconditions on the design, they said we need to get to understand, we need to build a relationship with individuals in these circumstances. And out of the dialogue and partnership we develop, begin to evolve a design that responds to their needs. And out of that, they've come up with some extremely creative things. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I was there many, many, many months ago when the program was kicking off. And... Um, one of the individuals there had been in the program for about five weeks and he stood up and he did this really dramatic, raised up his hand real high and stood up and said, I am somebody. I am, I am a human being. And I looked at him like, what the hell is he? And, and I, it was an identity card. He hadn't had an identity card in 11 years. He hadn't had a source of identification. And he was, and he's, he was clearly had a Salvation Army suit on, trying to look as good as he could. I mean, this was a guy really trying, but it took, an, a, a, to do that kind of habilitation, took a program of longer dose, a very different kind of staffing mix, greater tolerance for all the boundary testing to engage this person, and they kind of figured out how to do that with this program. So now this is, I'm going to tell you, this is months later. I go back last month to the city of Philadelphia, the mayor, city of, the mayor's making a difference dinner to celebrate all these people who've contributed to the recovery community in the city of Philadelphia. And I, I arrived just before it's time for me to go up and speak for my travels, and I, there's a bunch of people who come up, uh, the, the kind of dignitaries, to kind of greet me and welcome me. And one of the things that I do when I travel a lot, particularly when I'm going to these kind of programs, is I give ties away. I give whatever tie I'm wearing that day, I give it to somebody early in recovery, right? Or I'll give them some other kind of chip or some other things. But, but I give a lot of ties away. So, and on this day, I, get, I, I asked this person if I could give him my tie, right? Because I told him how touched I was with his story. So I got all these dignitaries who just met me, ready because I'm going to be speaking at this thing. And guess who I see peeking through the dignitaries doing this? <laughs> he's got, he got this super clean suit on. And he's got what was once my tie from that pop. Isn't that incredible? I mean, this is an amazing story. Uh, he's, got, he's got about a year now. And imagine somebody who hasn't had an identity card, who's lived under a bridge for 11 years, who now has a year of recovery. Never, would have, he would have never lasted in a traditional treatment program that long. When he would have, he would have, we would have either had flight or he would have been thrown out under, for any number of, of reasons. High waiting list, special obstacles to treatment access. Weak engagement, dropout rates between call, call and first appointment. What do you think of this? 50 to 64% we lose. Let's talk about, as part of this engagement, right? I really want to talk about access and engagement. By engagement, I'm talking about the ability to build a relationship in which somebody can not only initiate, but complete treatment. In the United States, more than half of 1.9 million people admitted each year to publicly funded addiction treatment. More than half will not complete that treatment. So let's look at the numbers and see what they tell us. 48% will complete, quote unquote. 29% are going to split. They're going to leave against staff advice across modalities. 12%, and that varies from 12 to 18% over the past five years, uh, will be administratively discharged, usually for one of two things. What? Alcohol or drug use, one. Or rule violations, which is interesting because a whole lot of the rules, when you think about it, have almost no connection to long-term recovery, right? I mean, they, they have a lot to do with, with lack of social skills and other, you know, problems with authority, but there are a whole lot of people in long-term recovery that still ain't got real good social skills and still got problems with authority and they're just doing fine, thank you. 
But we expel, my, my, my point is we're expelling a lot of people out of treatment for part of the very conditions that need to be treated. So we're kind of, we're really rethinking the circumstances on can we create a friendly enough environment and stay connected enough with people that we lower the split rate and also dramatically lower the number of people we're extruding from treatment. And so does that mean that we rigorously evaluate those in a recovery management model? Absolutely. We, we see retention is absolutely critical. You talked about the 90-day service dose. Absolutely critical when we talk about 90 days across levels of care. What does it mean when we have these kind of numbers that more than half of people will not complete a, a, a course of treatment? So these numbers simply have to change. 